right, guys, so I am here with Dr. Ken Berry. I'm not gonna sound like a cheese ball because we were talking a long time before. So um, you have been appearing in my life somehow by the universe of popping in. I saw you on um, uh, uh, Instagram and also you live very close to my mother. And so uh, that really got me to start paying attention more to you because you live near my mom, literally. And uh, checking out your channel, I was like, this dude's the shite. That's what's up. Here we have a doctor nice. who's willing to be straight with you guys. And so that's the reason why I wanted Ken, you so badly on my channel to let people know like, like what's coming out of your mouth is some real stuff. So I asked Ken, I asked you, um, uh, first of all, I want a little bit of background. I hate when people ask me, that. actually, that's my worst. I hate when people ask for background, but I'm going to ask that anyway. Um, and then we're going to go deep dive into it. So you want to just tell us who you are to yeah. my, my followers? Sure. So I'm Dr. Ken Berry. I'm a, a family physician. I've been practicing almost 20 years. And the majority of my practice is in a very tiny rural community in kind of middle western Tennessee. Recently moved to Nashville and uh, going to be opening a small practice here in the near future. Benton County was the county I practiced in. It was it was one of the most unhealthy counties in the entire state. The rates of obesity and smoking and, and fatty liver and, and the life expectancy, they all were terrible in Benton County. And so I really it, my initial mission was to make Benton County one of the healthiest counties in the state of Tennessee. So I started small. And then I, you know, as I started looking at the worldwide trends in diabetes, fatty liver, obesity, morbid obesity, uh, kidney failure, all these things, I'm like, you know, this is not a Benton County problem. This is a human problem. And it, it's uh, right about that time, my wife, Nisha, who I, I, every time I don't listen to her, that's a mistake. <laughs> She said, you know, you should make a YouTube video. And I'm like, that's dumb. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be a YouTuber. What in the world? And so about the 10th time she said that, I finally was like, you know what? Fine, I'll make a YouTube video. And so it turns out she was right because I, I feel like I've been able to help more people through the YouTube channel than I would ever be able to help seeing 20, 30, 40 people a day in a clinic. And and awesome. also I enjoy talking. So, you know, there you go. Uh, and, and so, but the really the turning point in my career was a few years into my medical practice, I started gaining weight. And I'd always been very slender and very athletic growing up and in my early 20s. But my late 20s, early 30s, that started to change. And I had those genetics where I was starting to get more insulin resistant. That's one way to look at it. The other way is to say I was becoming hyperinsulinemic from all the carbohydrate crap that I was eating. And I tried to eat pretty good, but still, I, you know, if I went back and calculated it today, I was probably eating 250, 300 grams of carbohydrates every single day of my life. But they were whole grain carbs, so they were okay. That's how I thought of it back then, right? But the scale didn't lie, and my belt didn't lie. And so one day I bent over to tie my shoes and got short of breath. I got winded. And it, at my heaviest, I was 297 pounds. What? And was, yeah, it was pre-diabetic. And, and I was like, what the heck? And so I'm a country boy, if you couldn't tell that. And uh, where I grew up, we're very matter of fact, and we're very common sense oriented. And so if something looks stupid, it probably is stupid. And so I thought, how stupid does it look for this fat, unhealthy, miserable, inflamed doctor to walk into your exam room and then proceed to tell you about your health. You see, you see that? And it's just like, I can't be that guy. I, I got to fix this. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And so I went, I, I looked up all my nutrition notes from medical school. I read through all that. And it basically, I could sum it up very quickly, eat lots of whole grain, don't eat any saturated fat and jog. That, that was the entirety of human nutrition that we were taught for healthy, normal people walking the street. And I tried that for two, two or three months and gained another 10 pounds. And I'm like, OK, so it's quite obvious. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to human nutrition. And so I basically took off my doctor hat and put my student hat back on and read more books than I'd care to admit, more research articles. I mean, I, I basically just engulfed the entire field of nutrition. And then I started hearing about the ad, you know, I'd heard about Adkins before, but that was just some fad. But when I actually started looking at the science behind it, I'm like, well, that actually might make sense. And then Mark Sisson and his primal diet, Lauren Cordain and his paleo diet. And I kind of put all that together. 
before I ever even heard the word keto or ketogenic. And I started doing kind of this high fat paleo diet. And I started to lose fat and I started to get healthier and I started to have more energy. And I, I started not being pissed off all the time, every single minute of every single day, like I was before. And I thought, you know, maybe I was taught all the wrong stuff about human nutrition in medical school. And so as I progressed from paleo ancestral primal into the ketogenic diet, and then now lately I've been almost exclusively fatty meat carnivore this is the best that I have felt since I was in my early 30s. Right? I'm currently 51. And when I tell people I'm 51, they're like, you ain't. There yeah, yeah no, I am. You look I great. Am. I'm 51. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel great. And I think, and, and what I want people, I don't want people to look at me and be jealous. I want you to look at me and see an example. Like if this fat redneck did this, <laughs> I can do this too. It's not that hard. No, it isn't. So this is, this is like the road on how you got here. I didn't know like the story about your wife and saying doing YouTube video because you've got a yeah. lot of people following you, really loving what you say. It seems like you just kind of give it to people, give it to people straight. Like that's mm -hmm. what it feels you, like yeah. when I talk to you. Almost I, all my videos are one take I, and I actually do all my, with a camera and my earbuds. That's how I do every, I don't have a studio. I just do this. I mean, and uh, yeah. I mean, I do now. But I've been on the, the internet for 10 years with my iPad yeah. and my yeah. cell phone yeah. as yeah. my videos you did it that way. until sure. just you did recently. It that way. Huh? Yeah. You did it that way back in the day. I sure. did it that way with just absolute garbage and people used to complain all the time. And it was, it's just because of McAllis <laughs> that I'm here. It's just literally yeah. because he started working here. He's like, come here and film. So I just got lucky. Um, nice. Okay. So that's, that's where you led up to now. So you're, you are, okay. I want to, cause we're going to go into like your diet and all of this. And uh, I want to go do that. And I actually want to talk about your life on the internet and how do you feel about that? Cause I talked to Mike about that as well, Mike Mutzel. And I thought yeah. that would be an in interesting subject to actually, um, to end this whole thing with before you've got to go. But I asked you via text, what do you want to <laughs> talk about? Because I don't like when people come up with questions I don't like because it steers me in the direction of stuff I don't want to talk about it. So I wanted to know yeah. what you can. And you said, black folks. And I was like, and I, we, we were talking about this in the pre-talk uh, uh, talk because it's more of a talk than an interview. And I was like, black folk, really? People who look like me? But of course, you know, as, as far as brown skin goes. So um, why, can you tell me why did you want to talk about uh, black people? Where I like to, to be and where, what I like to work on is where I can do the most good for the most people. And as you probably know, the, the epidemics of type 2 diabetes, of fatty liver, of morbid obesity, they're worldwide problems. But, but when you look at the rates in the African-American population, it's, it's off the chart higher than the average and so that, you know, why do bank robbers rob banks? Because that's where the money is, right? So <laughs> why do I want to talk about the African-American community? Because that's where I can do the most good. Exactly. That's where I can save the most lives and I can save the most feet and toes and legs and save the most kidneys and save the most eyeballs is in the community that is currently metabolically the sickest. And that's, that's the African-American community in the, in the U.S. for sure, without a doubt. Absolutely. And you're from the South. So you're getting a lot of a uh, big, huge black population in the South. Whereas my mom actually is from Tennessee, moved out to California and I was born <laughs> here, but still the South Southern states are going to have a large population. So I know that, that, that this is a big part of your demographic as far as uh, the patients that come in with illnesses. Yeah, sure. Um, I trained in, in Memphis at uh, the University of Tennessee there. And then I did my residency at St. Francis Hospital there in Memphis. And uh, I think I think that it's probably more than 50% African-American population there. And so, I mean, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you the number of, of legs I saw chopped off and people started on dialysis and blindness due to just uncontrolled diabetes. And my education, the nutrition education that I was taught is actually making that worse. Wow. Because when you tell someone, hey, stop eating Fruit Loops and chocolate oh. milk for breakfast, stop that. And I, instead, <laughs> I want you to eat a whole wheat bagel and some, <laughs> some sugar-free jam and drink a big glass of organic, non-GMO, hand-squeezed orange juice. That sounds better, doesn't oh, it, right? That so sounds right. healthier. Yeah. 
But that ain't that ain't healthier. Mm. That's got exactly the same amount of sugar in it as as the Lucky Charms and the chocolate milk. It's there's no difference. And so what you've just done is you've given that person a false sense of hope. Oh, now I'm doing something better but they're not. And then you're still harming them. They're still getting sicker every day. They're still destroying more nephrons in their kidneys, more rods and cones in their retina. Every day they're getting sicker while you've given this, them this busy work and they feel like they're doing something meaningful, but they're not. It's not meaningful. It's, no, it's not a meaningful change. And so that's why I'm trying to get the word out there to every human, but, but definitely the people who are the sickest, step away from the carbohydrates because they are your enemy. Do you think there's a genetic disposi disposition behind the reason why uh, black people tend to have uh, more of these health issues? Or do you think that it's coming from sort of like a slave uh, mentality and from, um, you know, not coming from a higher de de uh, uh, economic demographic? Yeah, I think it's both. I think there probably is a little bit of a, a genetic predisposition to not be able to handle the carbohydrate load that Caucasians can handle. But predominantly, I think it's a socioeconomic issue. And if you if you look at a at a countrywide map of all the counties in the in the United States, right? If you say, okay, where what are where are the poorest counties? They're in the southeast. Southeastern United States. Where is the most obesity in the southeastern United States? Where is the most type 2 diabetes in the southeastern United States? Like literally these maps overlap county for county. The poorer the county is, the higher the rates of obesity and diabetes. And that's not, and you know, you say, well, they're obviously eating too much or they wouldn't be obese. No, they're eating too much crap. If that's why they're obese. And so, I mean, we can we can go as, as big picture as you want to go on this. We can talk about SNAP benefits. And when you, you know, you, you use, go use your card, what's covered? What about WIC? What do they cover on WIC and what do they not cover? If you wanted to buy ribeye and heavy cream with your WIC, could you do that? Nope, you sure couldn't. But you could buy all the oats and whole grain bread and cereal that you wanted to buy. And so that before we, we went live, we, you and I were talking about what I call the slave diets. And I don't mean that in a racial context. I mean that in a, con a socioeconomic context. But there is a slave. There is a connection from – I'm sorry, but it's I mean, the truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not drawing that connection. It just is. It just it's is. Just, it just exists. Yeah. And so when you are a world leader, a dictator, a, a, uh, an emperor, or a president, and you've got millions of poor people you got to feed – you can't. You can't break the country to feed those people. And so you're going to feed them grains and beans, basically, and skim milk. That's what you're going to feed them. And, and you know, lots of lots of fruits and, and the cheapest of the vegetables, which are the, the beans and the tubers, that's what they're going to eat. You that's think, what you're going to feed them. Do you and think so this is the, a – You actually – go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry. So I don't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to ask, do you think this is a form of racism? <sighs> I don't think it's a form of conscious racism uh, because it, it's not, uh, you know, if you look in these Southern counties, the white folks are just as fat, <laughs> just as unhealthy as the black folks. But I think it affects the African-American community sooner because of that genetic predisposition we talked about before. And I, I don't know of any studies that compares like an African-American family's diet if they're if they're below the poverty level versus a, a Caucasian family's diet if they're below the poverty level. I don't know if there's any studies like that. I'd love to know if right? there are. Yeah. That'd be a great study to do because then that would just immediately tease out the genetic differences. If, if these, you know, if they got the same level of poverty, but, but the African-Americans, you know, have kidney failure at a 10 times higher rate, then that's obviously genetic. But from just my experience as a practicing physician, it's much more likely that a Caucasian person is going to get morbidly obese and have heart trouble. Really? Right. Or yeah, and then uh, an African American person, they're going to get, they're going to be obese, and they're going to have kidney. It's going to be the kidneys, right? Almost every time, and and so the if you look at the rates of dialysis, it, the African American population has a much higher rate of having to be on dialysis per capita and per if you if you kind of uh, level the field for everything else except for just race. African-American kidneys, they just cannot tolerate the carbohydrates. Uh, 
And then when I was training at the VA Medical Center in Memphis, it was always an African-American vet that was getting his foot cut off, getting his toes cut off, getting his getting his leg cut off either below the knee or above the knee because, you know, of his type 2 diabetes. And he would he would come faithfully and he would go see the nutritionist and the dietitian and he would try his best to do just what they said to do. And they would tell him to stop eating his ribs and his ham hocks and his, you know, and they would tell him, you got to eat more bread and more fruits and and vegetables. And and then he loses his other leg. So uh, I I do think there's a genetic predisposition, but I think probably the overwhelming problem, overarching problem is the socioeconomic disparity. Because if you look at the wealthiest counties in the United States, in Colorado and up in the Northeast, the rates of obesity are super low right. in, in everybody. They are. In they everybody, are. right? Yeah. The the life expectancy in the south, southeastern United States is anywhere from five to ten years less than the richest counties in Colorado or California or New York. That's that's not a coincidence. No, you're right. You are correct. It's very interesting how that works because my mom mom comes from a family of ten uh, siblings. Or she's, there's, including her, there's 10. Yeah. And then my mother and father moved out to LA and I was born here. So if you compare me to my cousins, because of course, 10 children produce a group of cousins. And sure. yeah, so their, their upbringing, my upbringing is completely different. And um, they all, my, all my aunts and uncles, most of them are starting to die from those, these types of complications, cancer or diabetes. Yep. Those are the two. Yep. My mom, cancer, her mother, diabetes, her brother, two brothers, di- diabetics. So you, you are correct on this. One of them on di- dialysis, like you said, her brother. Um, yeah. I do uh, think that, in my opinion, since, you know, I think this is a good going there kind of conversation. I don't think it's just a genetic de- de- disposition, predisposition because mm-hmm. of, I was analyzing this idea, which, cause we want to tie this into keto and carnivore and things of this nature before you have to go. But, um, this, this idea of being sub Equatorian and not European that we would maybe be exposed more to some more plant source foods, but clearly not the grains. So that's very interesting. Right. But, exactly. but definitely this, this concept of poverty, poverty, meaning I can't afford proper food, marketing, Popeyes, fried chicken, things of this nature in those neighborhoods, uh, um, liquor stores, things of this nature, making crap food more affordable for a lower economical demographic of people. So that's where I sure. asked if racism played a role in it because you can <clears throat> advertise those types of foods and these types of prices and put these types of markets in those areas. Um, My brother bought um, some foreclosure homes in Michigan. He thought when that whole collapse, economic collapse happened. And of course, it just happens that he's black, but he bought it in a bunch of homes and nice old Victorian homes. And he's just like, the way that they live, the way that their mentality is, it's very, very drawn from slavery. It's very uneducated, very like people have gone through rough, the food, everything, the disease, it's out of control. That's why I was asking more about the leaning on the like racist side, because basically what you eat, because I grew up in Cali and I went to almost all white high school, hence the white voice. So for yep. me, um, you know, I, my mom cooked good food and vegetables and meats and roasts and meatloaf and things of this nature. And it wasn't just garbage every day. So what do you, what do you, what say you? Yeah, I think that, I think they're probably, I I mean, you can't call it anything else except racism, but I think that the people at the, say the board of directors for Kellogg's, they're definitely not sitting around talking about race, but they, they do know who their demographic, who buys right. Lucky Charms and, and Special K and Corn Flakes. They know who eats that and they know who doesn't. And so I, I think, yeah, indirectly, it's, a, it's an unconscious version of it is probably more income discrimination than it is, you know, skin color discrimination. Hence I would poor guess. white folk or Mexican uh, exactly population. Right. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. I think, I think that's what it has everything to do with because you were just a, when you're, and you're growing up out in California, you were around a higher socioeconomic status people. I was, it just, I was. That's just the truth of it. Right. I was. And so it, it, if you'd have been running around with a big bag of Doritos and a Pepsi, they'd have looked at you like, what's wrong with you? 
right? And it, not that you didn't have that occasion when you were a teenager, but I'm saying if that if your family, like if that was family dinner, like it is at a lot of homes in the South, that's that's dinner. That's din- that wasn't right? in my and, home. My mother yeah. never bought soda. Right, exactly. Ever. But, but that's so ubiquitous in the South Southeastern United States, and the and the poor of the county, the more ubiquitous it is. Yes. Okay, that's really interesting. I love this, where we're going. Now, let's go into this whole thing about um, keto and low carb, because what I've noticed lately, uh, talking to black people, is the rise of veganism. Um, Mm -hmm. Trying to attach, you know, people coming in and teaching poor black people or poor folk about veganism. Um, which now I'm having to convert people who were never eating those foods, now eating those foods. Have you seen that happen also, or this whole vegan? I have, I have seen the, the the kind of the vegan groundswell of pro- popularity, and I think that's a very calculated uh, trend. I think that's a, a um, I think that's a made trend. I think that was bought and paid for, unlike some <laughs> trends that just spontaneously happen. Sure. Uh, let me first of all let me preface everything by saying that if if you're eating a 100 percent whole food, real food, vegan diet that does not include sugar and grains and industrial seed oils, I think that's a much better diet than the standard American diet or the Biloxi, Mississippi diet or the Memphis, Tennessee diet. That's a much better diet, no doubt. But I think that's not the optimal diet for people. And also, I think for most people, that's going to be quite expensive, quite time consuming and just so foreign to what they're used to eating that it's probably not going to be sustainable for for many folks. Growing up, I grew up broke as a joke. I mean, you know, growing up in my my neighborhood, my community, and if you had tried to make veganism popular there, it just, I mean, people would have just laughed at you. And there would have been, you know, 5 or 10% that would have tried it, and everybody else would have just ignored it. So I think it, it's much more, I think you get, you, more, you get more traction, you get more results with a, a cheap keto type thing, like I talk about in my, my YouTube video, Cheap Keto. Because I don't care how poor you are, you can afford some bologna and some potted meat and some deviled ham. And you know what I'm saying? You can afford that stuff. You can afford a pack of hot dogs and some mustard. Sure. That costs less than the family size bag of Doritos and the two, two liter true. or three liter Pepsi. Sure. But, but it, it actually leads to much less disease when you eat that. But so many people think, oh, I've either got to do this expensive, hard to do veganism or, or you know, keto has got to be so expensive. I got to eat grass fed, grass finished, panda massage, $22 a pound ground beef. No, you don't have to do any of that. Keto can be cheap. It can be easy. There can be no meal prep or there can be a ton of meal prep, whichever you'd rather have. But it's it's a it's accessible to everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status. And it's delicious and it's got lots of fat and protein. So it's it's very satiating and that makes it sustainable. It's easy to do. I think this is a good conversation in the sense that, you know, I've got the sort of like strict keto sort of Nazis going on. I hate to use the word, but I mean, I'm pretty strict myself, but I do, I'm, I'm very understand. People will pick apart like the smallest of things like Kerrygold isn't a hundred percent grass fed at the end of the day. And there's this whole, there are these arguments between certain carnivore groups of, um, or keto people of, you know, the quality of meat. And at the end of the day, they don't understand. There are people who don't make enough money to afford grass fed yeah. all they're just right. not they just can't right. afford exactly. it at all and gra- grass fed grass finished is better but if you actually look at the research it's maybe 3 to 5% better when you start looking at omega 3 to omega 6 ratios it probably does have less of the you know the, the 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 toxins it probably does have less of the antibiotics but in the big picture if you can't afford $22 a pound ground beef then what are you going to do? You're going to get your Cheetos and your Pepsi, and that's what it's going to be. I'm telling you there's a third path that you can afford and that you can do that's not frou-frou and not uppity. It's easy, it's cheap, and it's sustainable, and you can do it. I think the thing as well is that people who are watching this need to understand you're a doctor. So you're speaking from experience of what you see walk in the room. So you're not pushing for people to eat bologna. You're saying, I'd rather have you eat bologna over Doritos 
or I'd have you eat this food over that food because anything that's going to balance your insulin, like all, like you said, all these diabetics going on, if you're eating to Doritos, you, you won't get that out out of control. And what are some of the complications of uh, insulin resistance and diabetes? Yeah. So you got, you got fatty liver, which is now quickly becoming the leading cause of cirrhosis and liver failure used to it was alcohol you know when i was first starting to train if somebody came with with liver failure cirrhosis and ascites which is their bellies full of liquid they were an alcoholic in the story we didn't even have to ask them we just knew but now you cannot make that assumption because it's actually just as common if not a little more common for them to say no doc i don't drink at all i maybe have one drink a year on, on new year's and so if all, if you don't know about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you're, you're left speechless. You're like, well, you must have some weird genetic thing. No, they've got carbohydrate poisoning. When somebody drinks a 16 ounce Pepsi, the high fructose corn syrup in that is toxic to your liver. That's a toxic dose. It causes inflammation and your, your liver cannot process all that fructose. So you wind up just storing it as fats in your liver. It doesn't even have time to make it out to the other parts of your body. But the same thing also happens when you drink that 16 ounce glass of non-GMO organic hand squeezed (laughs) orange juice. It's exactly the same. There's no difference. And so you can see, Stephanie, if somebody's like, damn it, I'm not drinking that Pepsi anymore. I'm going to start drinking this this organic orange juice. They feel like that they've done something right. meaningful to help to improve their health. But actually, if you just took the Pepsi and sprinkled some vitamin C in it, that, that would be orange juice, basically. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, yeah. What do you, what, because you're doing more, you're talking more about carnivore. Are you doing carnivore now? Strict yeah, or, that's, that's or, been or writing natural. the line? Well, I'm probably 95 to 97% fatty meat carnivore. And so every now and then, like today, I put I put a, a tablespoon of chimichurri on my steak just for flavor, right? I'll have some cilantro occasionally, some some basil, some oregano that I, we grow herbs out on our, our back porch. And so I'll just chop some of those up and make a little something. Uh, but the vast majority of what I eat is very fatty meat, like ribeye, like ground beef, even the cheap ground beef. Um, uh, of course, lamb chops and stuff, because me and you can afford that. But for people who can't, you know, that big stick of ha- ground ha- hamburger meat at, at China Mart? That looks we don't like have China Mart here. <laughs> Yeah, we don't yeah, have that here in California. That's, all, that's where you buy your food at in the southeastern United States, <laughs> right? In the south, you go to China Market to buy your food. And there's a, it looks like a stick of bologna. That's the cheapest hamburger you can buy. That is excellent for keto if that's all you can afford. Now, if you're like me and Stephanie, you need to step it up and you need to buy that grass finished panda massage and, and go ahead and pay the money for it. <laughs> because economically, when enough of us do that, it's going to drive the price down. That's true. just the law of economics, right? True, true, and true. so the people that can't afford it do need to buy it because you're actually helping to grow that industry. And when they can scale up that industry, that good quality meat's actually going to get cheaper for everybody. But in the meantime, if you're broke as a joke, if you don't, you personally talking to you, don't know where you're going to get the rent money from, then you can't be buying that stuff or you'll, you'll have to file bankruptcy. You would. But you can't afford that bill stick, of cheap ground beef and that plus some mustard that's keto and that's going to get you there until you can afford to do better sure now um what are some of the um uh, i'm going to kind of swing to the other pendulum of being more on the cleaner side so now we said hey you guys we both agree that if you can't afford it then these foods that you're talking about the big huge stick of like plastic package looks like a big sausage roll you cut it up and you get uh, yep. minced minced beef in there if you're not that person and you're looking for something a little bit more um cleaned up um i'm very very uh, people know me as the strict probably the most strict keto person online do you actually try to do keto carnivore? Or are you just eating fattier cuts of meat? Like what's your, yeah. like, how do you do, are so you making I, it keto or not? Or Well, it's, it's going to, if you do carnivore uh, t- the tasty way, it's going to be keto. There's just no way around <laughs> it, right? Because the thing that's going to spike your insulin and the thing that's going to knock you out of ketosis is carbohydrates, Right. If you eat too much raw broccoli, you can knock yourself out of ketosis. Now, it's hard, no doubt, but it's much harder to do with a fatty ribeye than it is with 
a vegetable because vegetables by nature are just carbohydrate dense. That's what they are. And so my carnivore, I try to, I try to buy good quality meat because I can afford it. But very often if I can't, I mean, I don't, I would rather have a grain finished steak than a grass finished steak. I think they taste better. I like the fat. I like the marbling and that fat is also what's going to up my, my fat macro enough so that I can stay in a, in a state of deep ketosis at all time. Typically I'll, I'll eat during a two hour feasting window and then I'll fast for 22 hours every day, sipping on my coffee with some salt or electrolyte drops. And that's that's how I live my life unless there's some special occasion going on. But I have great respect for people who can afford it, who would much who would rather eat the organic non-GMO, you know, veg and, and <laughs> eat the grass finished panda massage meat. I think that it, you should do that if you can afford it. I think it's better for you, but I don't think, okay, so let's, let, let me, let me do it. I love to do the scales. So Cheetos are 1000 times worse than the cheapest hot dogs you can buy at China Mart. You get that a thousand times worse, Wow! but the cheapest hamburger is three to 5% worse than the most expensive, cleanest right. ribeye that you can get in the world. There's a, That's two, a good it, point. It is better, no doubt. It is better, but it's it's minimally better. And so if you can afford it, yeah, do it, man. Who don't want to live to be 150? But if you can't afford that, don't feel like that that's a barrier to entry, right? And because so many people, if they can't afford it, they're just like, well, I can't do that. Just forget it. Sure, sure. No, you can, you can do this. You can do it, and you can do it much cheaper than that. But if people can afford that, yeah, I, I do think it's 3 to 5% better. Okay. Um, I agree with you, by the way. Um, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. Okay. Um, what like do you, you hadn't already. The only thing we hadn't talked about is religion and 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 gender. I mean, I know, right? <laughs> huh? okay. okay, I'm getting the signal to look at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. We got a few more the more minutes here, but um, uh, what do you think about women who have because. I get a lot of the people whose hair's fallen out doing keto. So now we're just doing everything so great. Let's talk about the downsides. Let's keep it real. Let's yep. talk about the hypoglycemia, the thyroid, and the adrenal issues trying to do low carb ketogenic diets. Because the way you're yep. making it sound very easy. So let's make it sound a little complicated. Okay. What do you think? I think I think that none of that, um, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. Let's let's take each one individually. Okay. So let's tell you, we'll talk about hair loss first. Anytime, and it usually is more so in women than men, but anytime there's a stress in the environment, a woman's going to lose hair, right? And so if you have a, death, a close death in the family, if you lose your job and get a divorce, if you have a kid, if you uh, start a new diet, you're going to lose some hair. That's We don't know why that is, but that is definitely the case. But we have to go back and think ancestrally, what did we eat? 50,000 years ago, what do we eat on a daily basis? That's number one. And number two is the physiology. What, what's hair made of? How, do, how does our body make hair? And then thirdly, any meaningful research that we can find on the subject, right? And so if we go back in time 50,000 years, we've got carbon and nitrogen, uh, sta a stable isotope. We, can, we know what we ate 50,000 years ago. And hands down, we ate fatty meat if we could find it. If we couldn't, we ate some veg. And if we couldn't find either one, then we starved to death. That's just, that's the truth of it. Pretty basic. And so, so, so to say that, oh, women, and so women are special, no doubt, but they are 99.999999% the same as men when it comes to what diet they eat, in my opinion. And so should women not eat fatty meat? No, that women are human beings. They should eat fatty meat. That is good for them. And I can't tell you at the when we do when Nisha and I do Facebook lives on Monday night, I'll ask the question: How many people, when you started keto, your hair kind of fell out and thinned? But now, a year or two later, you've got the best hair of your life. Your hair is better now than it was ten years ago. The comments go by so fast we can't even read them. Best hair of my life. Best hair of my life. Best hair of my life. I'm sixty and my hair is better now than when I was forty. That kind mm. of comment. It just keeps coming. And so, yeah, you might have some hair loss with any big change in your life. But if you're eating what I consider to be the proper human diet, which is a diet filled with fatty meat, a little bit of veg, that is the diet that, that that's what hair is made of. And so ultimately, you're going to have the best hair of your life. Um, and so that was number one. Number two, thyroid. Me and Nisha were just live on Facebook and we were talking about this. My wife has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
she feels, and so the first time she tried to fast, she felt like she was going to die. And so for a minute, she believed all those gurus out there who said, oh, if you've got Hashimoto's, you shouldn't fast and you should do carb ups and all that stuff. Now, as she's continued to learn and continue to kind of go on her journey, she is fatty meat carnivore. Her Hashimoto, and she fasts every day for at least 16, 18, 20 hours effortlessly. She didn't even think about it. We'll look up at 4 or 5 p.m. and say, well, I guess we should eat something. Ah. That's, how it is. That's how it is at my house every day. And she's breastfeeding. We've got a, a two-and-a-half-month-old. and She's breastfeeding oh, wow. and making more, more milk than we know what to do with. Wow. And she's a fatty meat carnivore and fasts 16, 18, 20 hours a day with Hashimoto's. And the last time we checked her labs, on the, the Hashimoto's labs, her all her values are back to normal levels. And so to Is that with that meds women, though? Is that with Synthroid or level thyroxine or was without? With, that was without meds. Now she's taking really? a low dose of armor. Uh, oh, she's taking armor. Very low dose, yeah. Low, okay. low dose of armor. But before that, we couldn't get her numbers normal when she was eating the crap standard diet. I don't care how much armor she took or how much nature, she couldn't get her numbers down back to in within normal limits. But on fatty meat carnivore with daily intermittent fasting, her numbers are fine and she feels better now. If she's 33, she feels way better now than she did when she was 25. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an amazing story that people should really, you know, uh, resonate on if they want to go and sort of do like a, a ketogenic or fatty meat and cut out all the processed foods. Uh, the yep. benefits that that outweigh the the uh, the downfalls yeah. is what are, basically what I'm saying. What are what are the yeah. what are the, the the pits of these low carb diets? Like what are the things? What do you think about it? And you just said, hey, the benefits outweigh the the risks is what you're saying. Hugely. Well, I consider whether you're eating whether you're an ovo lacto pescatarian, but you're eating clean food and and real veg and and no sugar and no grains. So ovo lacto pescatarian. All the way to fatty red meat carnivore, that full spectrum I consider to be the proper human diet. Anywhere, somewhere in there is the proper human diet for you because you're a human being. It may be over here with tons of veg. You may need to eat seven to 10 cups of veg a day, but if I did that, I would be pre-diabetic and I'd weigh 297 pounds. For sure, for sure. For, for me, where I'm at with my, my hyperinsulinemia, I've got to be as close to zero carb as I can be. I don't think everybody needs to do that. Uh, some people feel great with carnivores. Some people hate it. And I, I think that's fine. Pick the pick the spectrum of the proper human diet that works for you, whether it's veg heavy, whether it's meat heavy. And it may change as you get older. It may change as you lose fat. It may change as you get healthier. Because I, if you told me three years ago, Stephanie, that, dude, you're going to be living on ribeye and sausages and ground beef. I would have thought <laughs> you were a, an idiot. Right. right? I'm, like, That's, I'm never going to do that. But I feel better now at 51 going on 52 than I felt when I was 35. And if anybody out there is in their 50s, you know what a statement that is to even be able to say that. For sure, because I'm going from 52 to 53. So oh, wow. you, got me, you got me beat. You're way older than me. <laughs> yeah. By a year. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to ask, because I know that you have to go soon, and I wanted to ask um, what, how – what are the the sort of the positives and the negatives about being a person on the internet um, with all the exposure? Uh, you know, because people can say and do the. I mean, they are re like the, what the world has turned into with the comments and. Yeah. Tell me the pros and cons of being a public figure on the internet. What's yeah. what's like. I hate those. I hate those negative comments just as much as you do. But I, I'm absolutely in love with the fact that anybody in the world can be heard, even if what they've got to say is idiotic and mean and hateful. I love it because never in human history has that loser that lives in his mom, his mom's basement <laughs> and plays video <laughs> games all day. Never in the history of humankind has he, he been able to be heard. Right. And, That's right? a good point. And you never know. He might come up with a brilliant idea. I doubt it. But he might. You never <laughs> know. And I think it's beautiful that we can all be heard, but we also can all be blocked. So don't forget that guy in the basement. OK, we can block you if you get too out of hand. That's true. But, so <laughs> when, when Gutenberg first perfected his printing press and it made it possible for everybody to actually read the scripture, that was a huge leap 
in human technology, right? When we had a radio, everybody could have a radio in their house. You didn't have to travel six hours to hear the president speak. You could actually just turn on the radio and sit in your chair and hear the president and not have to listen to what the either Republican or Democratic newspaper in your town said that he said. You can hear him yourself. Sure. Huge breakthrough for humanity, right? Then we've got television. Do all these technologies have bad things? Sure they do. But all in all, they empower people who never were empowered before. And I think I love that. I'm in love with that. I get goosebumps thinking about that 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 idiot in his mom's basement that, you know, if he gets Probably slapped like down that. enough making those stupid comments, he might actually think maybe I should Google something and become an expert in something. And so oh. a lot of times I'll answer those hateful comments very, very lovingly and helpfully. About, exactly. Yeah, I understand. You're having a bad day, but blah, 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 blah. And now every now and then I'll, I'll block somebody. But I love it that people get to be heard no matter how stupid what they're saying is. You know, I, I absolutely resonate with what you're saying because it, first of all, it took me a minute. I don't know if it's that way for you, but it took me a minute because I've been doing this for so long. When the comments started coming in, I wasn't used to it. So people would be like, well, what do you think of this person? Or this person said this and this person said this about you and like try to get you to fight with people. And before I had moderators on my live streams, I was like, you know, sort of reacting. And so it took me yeah. a minute, but you're right. Um, when I do have the time to even question any of these people nine times out of dead 10 i'm just having a bad day because if you're like yep. well what's going on what and i say yep. to people i'm not that that important it doesn't matter what i say you have your own free mind nobody's blocking you from thinking whatever you want to think right. so go for it like you know if you don't like what i'm saying right. it's all good so a lot of them and they'll say like well i was just having a bad day and you're like bingo and nine yep. times out of ten they react that way because they're not feeling good and when you actually just give them the attention that they're so thirsty for then they completely change and then become nice it's very weird i've actually I had i've actually had trolls come back a month later and apologize and be like wow. I, that was terrible I, I should never have said that i'm so sorry and i'm like it's okay we all have bad days don't worry about it just don't do it again or i'll block you <laughs> exactly <laughs> So basically you're saying that at the end of the day, it's all positive because yeah. people have a chance to be heard and you take the negative with, as a grain of salt. You can take it negative or not. It's up to you that's as right. a public yeah, speaker. Right. Do you yeah. have any last uh, uh, thoughts that you want to um, just, you know, tell the world on, on my platform? Because when you're speaking, it's, yeah. it's very weird when you're talking on your own channel, but when you're like, yo, tell me, talk to me. Do you have any thoughts that you just want to express? Yeah, yeah I think I want to say again, because I think it's the most important concept to understand whether you're eating a vegetable heavy and you're just eating a, some eggs and some cheese and some some crustaceans Station. because you don't want to eat mammals because they ha they're soft and cuddly and they have mom and they, <laughs> they have feelings. I get that. I totally get that. Or if you're a hardcore <laughs> Neanderthal and you eat nothing but ribeye and ground beef and eggs and butter and bacon. Those are all part of the proper human diet. What is not part of the proper human diet, which is not actually human food at all, is sugar on a daily basis in any form. And that includes honey and agave nectar. They are not daily foods for any human being. They lead to obesity, inflammation, and disease. All the grains are the same way. And back when I was paleo, I thought quinoa was a gift from above, right? Right. But quinoa is very high carb. And so any of the grains, wheat and soybean and corn, they're the worst, and, and canola because they're all GMO. But any of the grains, are they break down into glucose and fructose, every single one of them. You cannot argue that. That is science. It's proven. Nobody doubts that. You're trying to avoid too much glucose and too much fructose. Stop eating the grains. They are yeah. their uh, grains are and beans are excellent foods if you're trying to feed somebody very cheaply and keep them from starving to death. But if someone's looking for optimal health, grains and beans ain't where it's at. And then thirdly are the industrial seed oils. These are not foods for human beings. They should be lubrications and they should be used for other things. Canola oil is very dangerous and bad for you. Vegetable oil, Crisco, uh, soybean oil, peanut oil, corn oil, all these things are inflammatory. The, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is horrible. Stop eating those. If you've got canola oil in your cabinet or vegetable oil or, God forbid, Crisco in your cabinet right now, pause this video, pause it, hit the pause button, and go and throw that shit away right now. 
It is bad for you and bad for your family. Don't even give it to your neighbor unless you don't like your neighbor. So that true. stuff is poison. Okay? okay. So when you get those big three out of your diet, then you've got this proper human diet spectrum to play in, whether it's veg heavy or meat heavy. I don't care. I win either way because you get healthier. Love that. Love that. Because it, it's, and I'm learning that that's what your, um, your voice really is about is like, you don't have to be perfect, just be better. Right. So, yeah. So, and I, I think I'll adopt that when, when I talk more about that. Cause I tend to lean more on, you know, I'm not like so strict. Like when I travel, I'm not looking at, you know, do you eat grass fed when you travel? No. Cause I just need to eat. Right. Um, exactly. Uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more about, yeah. So I have a little YouTube channel. If you just search Dr. Barry and you can search Dr. Barry keto, Dr. Barry thyroid, Dr. Barry testosterone. I talk about all kinds of medical problems. Yeah. And so I'm on YouTube. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I have a little page there. My wife and I actually do a Facebook live and do, and answer questions for at least an hour every Monday night uh, at 7 p.m. Central Standard. I'm on Instagram. If I'm feeling especially salty and snarky, I'll jump on Twitter and slap <laughs> around some some big corporations. I'm, I'm known for tweeting out Kellogg's for poisoning children. And, and, and yeah, yeah. You just, uh, so if you're not feeling salty, don't follow me on Twitter. Right. You might be offended. Uh, I'm also <laughs> on Vero. I'm also on TikTok trying to reach teenagers TikTok. before they develop fatty liver and type two diabetes. We got to go where the people are. We got to go yeah. where the sick people are because they're the ones who need our help. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time because I know you're super busy with a new newborn and, and yeah. moving and all this kind of stuff. Uh, being a doctor and being on the internet and having a huge platform. So thank you, Ken. That was It's been a is, pleasure. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah. And next time you're in town, come see me. We'll go eat a ribeye. And uh, I'd love to talk to you again sometime in the future. Yeah, maybe I'll do do some Facebook Live with you. Hey, there you go. Good idea. Okay, cool. Thank you. My pleasure.